Good Sabbath, friends. Thank you for joining us today. The children of Israel were taken from Egypt, the scripture says, on eagle's wings. In Revelation 12, 14, the woman flies on eagle's wings to a place in the wilderness where she is nourished, safely hidden from the dragon. Our God can protect us and rescue us from danger, too. Let's begin today's worship with that reassurance. I'll play On Eagle's Wings by Michael Junkus. After I play, Alan will come with the announcements and the opening prayer. Welcome, everyone. We did have a serious technical glitch a short time ago. I think we have things back together for now, but uh, who knows? We're working on it. But uh, let's go ahead today and get started with prayer. Let's get right into it. So, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our many blessings and certainly for your great son and his great sacrifice for us. Please inspire today's message and help us to have open ears to hear to hear what you'd have for each of us. And please bless the technology we depend on. We ask all, of course, 
In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn is on page 291, Glory to Thy Name, by Sonia J. King. That's page 291, Glory to Thy Name. Our next hymn is on page 206, Consider the Lilies, by Mark Graham. The hymn's text is from Matthew 6, verses 25 through 33. That's page 206, Consider the Lilies. And now for today's message, Alan Holt with Watch Out.
Well, again, welcome everyone. Several months ago, there was a total eclipse of the sun that crossed a good part of the United States. Jackie and I witnessed this eclipse in person, and it was a truly spectacular event. We could even see some bright red solar prominences along the edge of the eclipse sun. It was awesome. But an ominous devil comet had been predicted to appear in the sky during the eclipse. This allegedly meant that something very bad would happen. The comet's real name, by the way, was Pons Brook. There was also a planetary alignment near that time that was said to likely cause catastrophic damage over all the Earth. Now, some Christians listened to these false prophets, and they became very fearful of this day. I know a few refused to leave their homes due to all the false prophecies coming from the Internet and other sources. So what happened to the world on the day of that solar eclipse? Well, nothing unusual, really. The Devil Comet was so-called because at one point, a natural and common outgassing occurred, and the solar wind swept the gas toward the rear of the comet. Seen in images from powerful telescopes, this outgassing appeared as two streams of vapor blowing back from the comet. Now, this is not at all an uncommon event with comets. But there were those that claimed that this resembled the devil, since a person's imagination, I guess, might allow them to see these two streams of water vapor as horns, uh, the two horns of Satan. Now, first, I'd say this takes a bit of imagination. And second, this is actually contrary to how our Bibles describe Satan. I believe Christians who really study and know their Bibles should have been aware that this had absolutely nothing to do with Satan, or really anything else for that matter. They should be able to discern a false prophet who's not speaking truth. At least I hope so. You know, not from our Bibles, nor even from science in this case. And so if we're so easily deceived by these false prophets who speak without biblical support, or even scientific support, how will we identify the false prophets to come that will show us many great signs and even miracles. Now, I've seen more than one person in God's church recently come to believe that the Bible is not even true. Now, these are people who have been in God's church for many, many years. Suddenly, they no longer believe that their Bibles contain the inspired Word of God. And this is after many years of spiritual growth, studying their Bibles and praying. So, what are the ramifications for these people? Well, obviously, loss of faith in the Bible and loss of faith in their future. Well, they can no longer have any source of knowledge about what happens after death. And, of course, they would have loss of faith in the future of their loved ones as well. And loss of faith in God. Also, the loss of fellowship with the brethren, the very people they need for support as we move through these end times. The deceptions that these false prophets speak of concerning things like devil comets and worldwide destruction due to a planetary alignment, well, they're a problem. But I believe what we're seeing today, and as far as deception goes, can be far more serious with ramifications of a spiritual nature. I don't believe we need to wait for the beast to appear. I believe we're experiencing an increase in the number and the severity of deceptions today. In talking to people recently, many of them told me they have no fear at all of being deceived. They say, well, you know, my faith is strong. I'm not worried about losing it. Now, I'm not suggesting that we worry about losing our faith, but I am a bit concerned that complacency might make us a good target for Satan. So today, I'd like to look at spiritual deception. We might call it spiritual warfare, but it's time. We need to be ready. Let's uh, begin the day by turning to 1 Peter. That's 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. As true followers of Jesus Christ, we never want to become complacent. We need to stay on guard. We need to be very careful that we do not become deceived. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Here we read, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking 
whom he may devour. Whom are this steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Good News Bible says, verse 8, Be alert, be on watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him, because you know that other believers on all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. Other believers throughout the world have the same issues with potential deception and being led away from the truth of God and His Holy Bible. We all need to be on the lookout for things that might draw us away from our faith. When I was ordained as a minister, I had some questions for the pastor of the church. Things like, you know, what am I required to say and do? Or what do I need to avoid saying and doing? I was thinking of specific doctrines that I know many churches have. What was his answer? Well, the elder said, that's none of my business. He said, that's between you and God. I really like that answer. That's the way it should be. Neither ministers nor anyone else should ever insert themselves between people and God. But still, I wanted the advice of someone who'd been at this a lot longer than I had. I was seeking wisdom from a person who'd been ministering to God's people for many years. So I asked him what advice he could give me. So he really had one single piece of advice. I'll explain it to you. Here it is. He said, he told me that Satan does not like it when ministers speak the truth from God's word. Satan may not be quite as concerned with those ministers who preach unbiblical things like God's commandments are done away with or those that promote customs of the false gods. He told me that he'd witnessed several very devout men of God fail. He mentioned some very prominent men in the churches of God that had, they had their ministries destroyed because they were not vigilant in keeping watch. He said to me, You may think that you're safe from Satan's attacks. You'll never be led astray. So did many other men in the ministry. But they let their guards down. I know of some of the ministers he mentioned. Some gave in to sexual temptation, and some succumbed to greed and stole money from the church. And a few, after doing what I consider a great job in the ministry, actually came to renounce the Bible entirely. They say they no longer believe that the Bible is truly the Word of God. It's difficult for me to believe that anyone could study the Bible for that many years, and then suddenly decide it's not the inspired Word of God. After seeing all the prophecies that were fulfilled, <clears throat> and after seeing the great wisdom of the Bible, the wisdom the Bible teaches that can really only come from God, yet they suddenly and, to my knowledge, inexplicably decide everything they'd been teaching for years, none of it was true. Well, it's not just God's ministers that need to be vigilant. I will be the same applies to us all. Let's turn to Revelation. Now, if you would, that's Revelation chapter 13 and verse 13. That's Revelation chapter 13 and verse 13. Maybe jumping ahead a bit, but uh, this is speaking of the second beast of Revelation. Now, here we're going to read about some real deception, okay? Revelation 13 and verse 13. And he, that's the second beast, and he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Bringing fire down from heaven? That would certainly get my attention. Verse 14. And deceives them, deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So here we're seeing miracles. Miracles occurring. Now, to me, this would be a lot more convincing than just hearing someone on the Internet falsely prophesy. And that would be pretty incredible, wouldn't you think? Pretty convincing. Let's continue. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. 
Okay, hang on to that thought for a minute. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. You may be familiar with what's in this uh, beginning of this chapter. Exodus 20, verse 4. So, if we witness a miracle, how do we know if this is from God or from an ungodly source? Well, in Revelation 13, verse 14, we're told that when we see these miracles, we're to make an image to the beast, right? Well, what does God have to say about making graven images? Well, as one of God's Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 4 tells us, You shall not make unto you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, the miracles associated with the command to create an image of the beast are clearly not from the one true God. That's not consistent at all with his own commandments. We'll turn to 2 Thessalonians next, if you would. That's 2 Thessalonians. We'll go to chapter 2 and verse 9. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. As time passes, we will see many things, including many miracles, that will attempt to turn us away from the one true God. The only way to avoid becoming deceived is to study our Bibles and pray. If we get close to and stay close to God, we'll be able to discern these coming deceptions and avoid them. Again, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Let me read that again, the first part in the easy to read version. It says, when that man of evil comes, it will be the work of Satan. He will come with great power. And he will do all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but at pleasure in unrighteousness. I'd like to mention here the word damned does not refer to being sent to hell. Hell, as most believe, of course, does not exist. The word damned in the Greek is the word krino, and it actually means to decide or to judge. So at this point, they'll be judged, not necessarily sent to hell. But brethren, we have not seen anything yet as far as Satan's deception goes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's turn to Matthew 24, verse 3. It's Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. You're probably familiar with this, but here Christ is explaining what things will be like shortly before his return. His disciples had asked what signs we would see as his return grew near. And here's Jesus' answer. Matthew 24, verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Or the end of the age is a better way to put that. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto, him, unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. The very first thing Christ warns us about is to not be deceived. That's how important it is. So we should not take his admonition lightly. Drop down to verse 24. We're going to see more of what we just saw a minute ago, I believe. That's verse 24, Matthew 24, 24. He continues. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. So here Christ himself warns us that we will be seeing false prophets that will show us some really great signs and wonders. How great? Let's finish in verse 24. Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 
we will be seeing some very powerful deception before Christ returns. But remember that many are called, but we know that few are chosen. To be one of God's elect, we simply can't afford to fall for the coming deceptions. Deceptions that would deceive even the very elect, if that was possible. We need to be ready. We need to stay vigilant. We need to continue to study our Bibles and to pray. As I said recently, I've seen some good brethren become deceived and fall away from the faith. We need to be very careful that we don't let this happen to us. I know some might say, well, that'll never happen to me. I suspect that may have been the same attitude that led to some of our dear brethren eventually departing from the faith. Turn to Jeremiah 12 next, if you would. That's Jeremiah chapter 12. We'll go to verse 5. That's Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5. So if we're being deceived by little things like the devil comet today, what will happen when we have real deception in the future, complete with miracles? What happens when we see the real deception? Again, Jeremiah 12, verse 4. I'm sorry, 12, verse 5. I'll be reading from the God's Word version. It says, If you have raced against others on foot, and they have tired you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in open country, how can you live in the jungle along the Jordan River? So what we're seeing here is that we need to practice being very vigilant today so we won't be deceived when things get really bad. So we can't keep up with what's going on today. It's only going to get worse. I'd like to read an article to you from our part of the article from Bible.org. Um, if you go there, you'll see a thing called Lesson 9, Avoiding Spiritual Deception. Uh, they're quoting from Colossians 2, 1 through 5. We'll get to that in a minute. This was actually written uh, or published on January 3rd, 2016. It's a few years old. Let me read this to you anyway. Quote, We live in a time of unprecedented widespread deception. The past year saw 750 documented data breaches, stealing the private information of 178 million Americans. When identity thieves get your credit card numbers, they can print up phony cards and take out cash or run up bills in your name. When they steal your social security number, they can file a tax form and steal your tax refund. Telephone scammers prey on everyone, but especially on the elderly. The biggest scam is fraudsters who pose as agents of the IRS, telling people that they will be arrested or their property seized for back taxes if they do not pay up immediately. Another popular scam consists of people posing as employees of tech companies who tell you that your computer has a virus. They need remote control, remote access to your computer and your passwords so that they can fix the problems. And for a fee, they will provide a year's worth of tech support. They really don't, but anyway. These statistics and examples are from an AARP email dated 12-23-15. While these schemes can cost people financially, spiritual deception can result in a person's eternal ruin. Satan has been employing his deceptive lies since the garden. Warning the Corinthians about not receiving a false Jesus or a different gospel, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, But I'm afraid that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of of devotion to Christ. Close quote. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 2. Let's begin in verse 1. And again, that's Colossians chapter 2, beginning right there in verse 1. So while we do need to avoid deception that costs us money, we really need to avoid the deception that costs us spiritually. This is actually a much more important and Excuse me. <clears throat> this is a much more important issue in the long run. We should know that, of course. Again, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul's speaking to those in Colossae. He says, For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, 
that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. I'll reread verse 4 in the easy-to-read version. It says, I'll tell you this so that no one can fool you by telling you ideas that seem good but are false. And the Good News Translation. I'll tell you then, do not let anyone deceive you with false arguments, no matter how good they seem to be. Some people are very good at twisting Scripture and even using false extra-biblical teaching to draw us away from the truth and from God. Now, sometimes our arguments can sound very convincing, at least on the surface, so we must examine what they say very, very closely. Verse 5, Paul continues here. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding, beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, brethren, our faith must be steadfast. But you know, it seems, I guess, somewhat ironic to me that while Paul is telling us that our faith must be steadfast, many today use the words of the Apostle Paul to reject the truth. The Apostle Paul can be easily misunderstood. As a matter of fact, hold your place here in Colossians, if you would. We'll be right back. Let's turn over to 2 Peter, if you would. Uh, hold your place there. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. That's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. 2 Peter 3, verse 14. Now, here Peter's been talking about the earth and the works therein that will be burned up and replaced with a new heavens and a new earth. So that's what we're up to. Let's pick up the dialogue in verse 14, where we're told that if we're looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth, in other words, God's kingdom, we need to be ready. We need to be found without spot and blameless. Again, that's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Now, if we discount what Paul says in our Bibles, if, if we disqualify Paul's writings as being inconsistent with the rest of the Bible, I believe we're going to also have to disqualify Peter. Since Peter says... Paul's writings are wisdom. If we disqualify the words of Paul and Peter in our Bibles, then what does that leave us? If we believe this, then the entire New Testament becomes suspect and cannot be trusted. And if we cannot believe the words of the New Testament found in our Bibles, then do we really have any solid evidence that Christ ever came and died for our sins? Do you see where this deception is going? Let's continue in verse 16. Here Peter's still speaking about Paul. And also in his epistles or his letters, speaking in, them, <clears throat> speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to, under, hard to be understood. So here Peter tells us that yes, Paul can be difficult to understand at times. We need to be very careful that we study the words of Paul closely and correctly come to understand the meanings of Paul's words, as well as all Scripture, really. Okay, let's go back to 2 Peter 3, verse 16, and start from the beginning. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other Scriptures, unto their own destruction. And we see that all the time. We need to be very careful before we dismiss the words found in our Bibles. Very, very careful. Verse 17. 
Yet therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. We do indeed need to prove all things to ourselves. We need to be very, very careful when we hear things that contradict our Bibles, especially man's tradition and extra-biblical sources not written under the inspiration of God. There's much deception today, and it'll only get worse tomorrow. We need to be prepared for that. Well, some form of the word deception is mentioned at least 150 times in the King James Bible. Let me just read a few other examples where deception is mentioned. There are too many to go to today, but by the way, as you know, deception is very much emphasized in the latter days. But let me read you a few. For example, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 tells us, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. This doesn't just apply to people out in the world. Now, these are people that knew the truth and abandoned it. We can't depart from something unless we're already there, right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 just tells us, Let no man deceive you by any means. Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of of disobedience. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. This is the Bible in basic English. Don't be tricked by false words. Evil company does damage to good behavior. 1 John 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whosoever a man sows, or whatsoever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Let's turn over to Jeremiah chapter 9 to continue. That's Jeremiah chapter 9. We'll start in verse 4. That's Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 4, near the beginning. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with listening to people, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. But we really cannot place our complete trust in others that they'll always teach us correctly. We ought to be care careful about this. But again, Jeremiah 9, verse 4. This time I'll be reading in the English Standard Version. It says, Let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother. For every brother is a deceiver and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They worry themselves committing iniquity, heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit. They refuse to know me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and test them, for what else can I do because of my people? Their tongue is a deadly arrow. It speaks deceitfully with his mouth <clears throat> with his mouth each speaks peace to his neighbor but in his heart he plans an ambush for him again we can't just always believe what people tell us we must always prove everything to ourselves now, the bible warns us repeatedly to avoid deception especially in the last days so what are some ways that we might go about avoiding Becoming deceived. Let's look to our Bible for some answers. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Right there in verse 1, we'll start there. Deuteronomy chapter 13. We know that we will witness miracles in the future. There may be someone who even foretells that something will come to pass, and it does. But does that always mean that these things are from God? Again, it's Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. We may have heard this referred to as the Deuteronomy 13 test. 
Okay. Deuteronomy 13, 1. If there arrives among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, where if he spake unto you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You might recall an example we saw earlier was that of a miracle that will prompt people to build an idol of the beast. So in that situation, uh, even miracles can't be trusted. Verse 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Excellent advice. If we're ever told to do anything contrary to what our Bibles tell us, never do that. No matter how convincing things might appear to be, always make sure it matches Scripture or it's not from God. Let me just read uh, 1 John 4, verse 1. It tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Let's turn over to Jeremiah next, if you would. That's Jeremiah 21, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 23. See it wrong? Jeremiah 23, verse 11. I may have said it wrong. Jeremiah chapter 23, beginning in verse 11. You know, there were false prophets and priests in Jeremiah's day. Can you believe that? We can read about the details at the beginning of chapter 23. But we'll start down a little bit down in uh, Jeremiah, chapter 23. This is the English Standard Version. Jeremiah 23, verse 11, speaking of those prophets that were talked about earlier in this chapter. Both prophet and priest are ungodly. Even in my house I have found their evil, declares the Lord. Drop down to verse 16, if you would. A few verses down, verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of God, It shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, No disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? If we hear someone who declares themselves to be a prophet, or even someone who may be acting like one, if they've not seen or heard from God's holy word, or are not paying attention to it, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Let's go next to Matthew. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. That's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Here's another warning and a way we can help determine if someone is speaking the true word of God. This is one thing we can look at. Again, that's Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. And once again, we're being told about false prophets being warned this time by Christ himself. Matthew 17, I'm sorry, Matthew 7 verse 15. He tells us, again, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're rabbiting wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not good <clears throat> sorry, every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I think that's a reference to the last day. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. One way we can tell if someone is not a true believer is that they do not bear the fruit that the Bible speaks of. There's a good chance they won't know what to tell us. <clears throat> I 
Well, not only can we be deceived by other people and principalities, we can also even deceive ourselves. That's right. We don't watch it. We can deceive ourselves or be pushed to do that, maybe by an outside force. Let me just read a couple of scriptures to you, and we'll go ahead after that. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, English Standard Version tells us, the heart, that's her, what we feel. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Proverbs 14, verse 12 tells us, there is a way which seems right unto a man, okay, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So we can deceive ourselves very easily. Let's turn next to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And that's, again, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Now here, the Apostle Paul warns us not to deceive ourselves. Just like I said, again, that's 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. We can deceive ourselves. Here's what Paul says. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. I'd like to add to that that Proverbs 3 verse 5 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. Lastly today, what about those who do turn away from the truth? Whether they've been deceived by others or even by themselves. What does the Bible have to say about those who were called and given knowledge of the evils of the world? What about those whose eyes were opened, followed Jesus Christ and the words of the Holy Bible, and then rejected them? 2 Peter 2, verse 20. 2 Peter 2, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. So it's really one thing to be ignorant of God's truth. And there are many people today who don't know who God is yet. Their eyes have not been opened. Some have yet to gain that understanding. But what about those that have been shown truth? They've been shown God's ways and later come to reject it. What about them? Again, 2 Peter 2, verse 20. For if after... They have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So we're better off to have not been called at all at this time, than to be called, see truth, and then reject it. We need to be humble. We need to remember that God knows all things. We need to always look to God and His holy word for truth. Not always trust others or even ourselves for the truth. Otherwise, we'll end up becoming deceived. And we'll be worse off than we were before we were blessed with the truth in the first place. So to conclude, there's much deception in the world today, and it's continuing to get worse. Some try to deceive us into giving them personal information that they can use to steal money from, from us. Some make merchandise out of us by enticing us to watch YouTube videos that teach false doctrine and prophesy events that are about to happen, but they don't. They're sensational things to draw our attention, and people watch anyway, even though they're not based in fact nor the Bible, and they don't come true. And these are serious issues, things we certainly should avoid. But there are also some that would teach us not to trust our own Bibles. Now, are there some minor translation issues with English Bibles? Well, yes, there are. 
But if we study our Bibles, we'll come to learn that our Bibles actually are very consistent. Prophecies spoken of have been fulfilled and continue to be fulfilled even today. But sadly, I'm seeing some of us faithful to the true God that have trusted the words of His Holy Bible for many, many years fall away. They now reject the words of God's Holy Bible. And that doesn't affect our finances. It doesn't just inconvenience us so that we fear the next prediction that doesn't come to pass. This can affect our very salvation. So I want to remind everyone today, including myself, to never take the great gift of our calling for granted. We need to remain ever vigilant, especially as we see deception increasing. If we think it's impossible or that we or as individuals are immune from being drawn away from God, this may well be the pride that goes before a fall. It's happened already to too many times, too many times rather, to too many good Christians. I hate to see that. But this is Alan trying to appeal to you. Let's have another appeal. This time from the Apostle Paul. We can find his words in our Holy Bibles. The Bibles we believe are inspired by our one true God. The Bible is to tell us that, for example, 2 Timothy 3, 6, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible is to tell us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, that's Romans 16, verse 17. Let's go over there. Take a look at that. I'll be reading to you in the English Standard Version. That's Romans chapter 16, verse 17. So uh, it's not just me that's making this appeal today, I don't think. Again, Romans 16, verse 17, Paul speaking. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please have a rest, a good rest of the Sabbath. Our closing hymn is on page 244, The Trumpet Shall Sound. After we sing, Alan will come off our closing prayer. That's page 244, The Trumpet Shall Sound.
Let's have my prayer. Our great Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our calling. We thank you for the wisdom found in your Holy Bible. Please be with us all and teach us, and strengthen us. Help us to understand your Holy Word and never be led astray by any means. Help us to be there for others who may be misled if we can help them. Prepare us for the time we will live in your great coming kingdom. Of course, we ask all according to your will and in the name of your great Son and our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.